Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I've been sharing with the people that have been here that to me this is more than a message. I really believe that this is a mandate from God and uh, I think it's something that is very vital for the times that we're living in. There's a big push for Christians to walk in love and worldwide people are talking about justice. And two of the main scriptures that they use is Isaiah 58 about the fasted life that we should live and how God says, I want you to take part of what you have and help hurting people, give it to the oppressed, the needy. But he also talks about being careful about the words of your mouth. In Isaiah 58, 9, he says, if you'll get some mouth control, you're going to get a lot quicker answers to your prayers. Now, that's not the way he says it, but that's what he means. And because I've already mentioned it twice, I'm not going to take the time to go over it. In James 1, 26, 27, the Bible says, if your religion is really real, if you're really spiritual, then you're going to bridle your tongue. And he says, you're going to be helping the widows and the orphans in their affliction. So we see the same thing again, once in the Old Testament, once in the New, that if we're really pleasing God, if we're really truly spiritual, if we're really living a fasted life like God wants us to live, then there's a couple things at least that are going to be happening. One, we're going to be watching our words, and two, we're going to be meeting felt needs. Both of those are the love walk, by the way. Love is not just a word that we should throw around and love everything from God to ice cream and each other occasionally, but love is something that can be seen and felt. It can change lives. It can make a difference for people. We must not forget that Jesus said that was the most important thing. And so I believe that how we talk about ourselves, how we talk, you know, about what's going on in our lives, how we talk about our future, I think all those things involve the love walk. The Bible says we're to love God, so that means we don't complain about our circumstances. We're to love ourselves. That means you need to be very, very careful how you talk about yourself. Do not be saying negative things about yourself. That's a no-no. Amen? And of course, we want to be very careful how we talk to other people. Now, Matthew 12 says, if the tree is good, it'll produce good fruit. If the tree's rotten, it's going to produce rotten fruit. It's talking about a heart-mouth connection here. A heart-mouth connection. What's in your heart will come out of your mouth if it's in your heart in abundance. If you think about something a little bit, I'm not saying that everything that goes through your mind is going to come out of your mouth, but if you think about it, if you're meditating on it, it's going to come out of your mouth. And when you say it, then you're likely to get it. Words are full of power. They can heal, they can wound, they can minister death, they can minister life, they can encourage, they can discourage, they can build up, they can tear down. People get divorces over words. Families are split apart over words. People lose jobs over words. People have insecurity and a poor self-image over words that have been spoken to them. Words are containers for power. And we need to choose our words very carefully. And it's time for us to step up to the plate and be accountable for the words that we allow to come out of our mouth. No man can tame the tongue. We need God's help. So you want to pray every day for God to help you with your mouth. Verse 34, you offspring of vipers, this is Jesus talking, Matthew's recording him, how can you speak good things when you're evil and wicked? For out of the fullness, the overflow, the superabundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man from his inner good treasure flings forth good things. And the evil man out of his evil storehouse flings forth evil things. And that's kind of what happens when we open our mouth. We just kind of fling something out of there. And then if it's something that we get in trouble for, we like to say, oh, I didn't mean it. I was just kidding. But that's not really true, and we need to start facing that. Now, 
verse 36 is kind of a, conscript- is a scripture we ought to be a little concerned about. It says, but I tell you on the day of judgment, men will have to give an account for every idle, inoperative, non-working word they speak. So there's a lot of idle conversation that we just talk to fill up airspace. We just say a lot of stupid things that just doesn't do anybody any good at all. And we're really bad about saying dumb stuff in trials. I tell you, this is just killing me. This just makes me sick. I'm just sick of this weather. I'm just sick and tired, sick and tired, sick and tired. And then we wonder why we're sick and tired. So I'm sure you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Now, I had a 12-point message that I got nowhere with last night. I laid a foundation, didn't get to the first point. This morning, praise God, we got to one point and one half of the second point. And so we're going to try to pick up in the middle of this. And if you weren't here, I'll tell you what the first point was. These are six things not to do with your mouth. The first one was murmur, grumble, find fault, and complain. We're not going to go back over that again except to just remind you that when we complain, we open a door for the enemy. The Israelites complained and they murmured and they spent 40 years trying to make an 11 day journey. And the Bible says plainly in Numbers chapter 21 that they kept murmuring, they kept complaining and God allowed serpents to come into the camp and the serpents bit them and 23,000 of them died and they finally got a revelation, oh, we have sinned. So I can hope by reading that, that we can be a little smarter than that. Actually, over in Corinthians, there's a scripture that repeats those scriptures in in Numbers 21 and basically says, I've recorded this here for you so you might not do the same thing that they did and fall in the wilderness through the same kind of sin which is named in 1 Corinthians as complaining. Now, the easiest thing in the world to do is complain. I think if we could make it past noon without complaining, that would be a pretty good sized miracle. How many of you agree? So we talked about that. We can't go back and talk about that anymore, except to just simply say that I really believe that we open doors for the enemy through complaining. God gave us our mouth for one reason, and that's to glorify Him. You have a mouth to glorify God. Amen? And that's what we need to use it for. Then I was talking about the second thing that we shouldn't do is gossip, judge, and criticize. And I got through one scripture, but there's one more that I want to share in Romans chapter 14. So if we could go there, please. Now, we know we shouldn't gossip, and that means tell tales and repeat stuff about people that we know that are negative or things that we've seen people do and we just want to go tell somebody. We need to cover one another, not uncover one another. You will get blessed if you will stop telling people stuff. Now, how many of you know we love to tell something? We love to know something. It's amazing how we want to tell what we know and we have to be very careful about this. Now, I'm just telling you this so you can pray things. There may be times when that's the truth. I do ask people to pray about things sometimes. I always make certain that it's somebody that I know that I can trust. But even then, you have to really check with your own heart and say, now, do I really want their prayer or am I just telling something and using prayer as some kind of a spiritual excuse to cover up my sin? I shared this morning how important it is to realize that when we say don't judge people, we're not talking about not judging sin. If somebody's in adultery, you know that. You don't say, oh, I can't judge that. Yes, you can judge that. It's sin. But you can't judge the person's heart. And you can't get a a judgmental attitude toward them. I think the biggest mistake that Christians make is when they do see somebody sin, not only do they judge the sin, but they write the person off and for the rest of their life, they have an attitude toward them that makes it very difficult for that person to ever be restored and to totally get over that. So we have these things that it's very obvious that we have to say that's sin, that's sin, that's sin. But I think a lot of judgment comes in 
in areas that really are just personal opinion. They're not even things that the Bible covers. It's just the way I do something versus the way you do something. And so you can judge me for that and say, well, you know, I wouldn't do that, and I don't think you should do that, and I believe you're wrong in doing that. But let's look at what Romans chapter 14 says about this kind of stuff. And I'm going to read just a little bit here. We're going to start in verse 1. As for the man who's a weak believer, welcome him into your fellowship. Don't criticize his opinions or pass judgment on his scruples or perplex him with discussions. One's man faith permits him to believe he can eat anything, while a weaker one limits his eating to vegetables. Now, I know we don't get into a lot of religious discussions over what people eat today, but that was a big deal in the days that the Bible was written because there was a whole issue over whether or not they could eat meat that had been offered to idols as Christians. And Paul said, it's not a problem for me because I know the idol is nothing. Therefore, I know that even if the meat's been offered to the idol, it's been offered to nothing. So I have the faith to eat it. But he's saying, if you don't have the faith to eat it, then don't eat it. Because if you eat it and you're not eating in faith, then to you it's going to be sin. And so there came this whole argument between the people who felt like you could eat it and the people who felt like you couldn't eat it and the people who could eat it felt like the people who couldn't eat it didn't have strong faith. People who felt like they couldn't eat it felt like the people who did eat it were in sin. And so we don't have the who's going to eat the meat offered to idols issue today, but we got plenty of other issues just like that where we can apply this same principle. And the bottom line is, is that stuff is between a person and God, and we don't need to even get involved in it. Verse 4, who are you to pass judgment on and censor another's household servant? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he shall stand and be upheld, for the master of the Lord is mighty to support him and make him stand. Now, let's just say that you were blessed enough to have a housekeeper. One of you over here, just, you're, you know, let's just say everybody here in this section is blessed to have a housekeeper. And let's say that everybody in this section lives next door to the people in this section. And these people over here come and knock on your door, and they don't like the way your housekeeper's cleaning your house. Now, what would you say to them? Well, I really don't think that's any of your business at all. I'm the one paying them. Well, you know what? When we don't like what other people are doing, they belong to God. They're His children, and that is His exact attitude with us. It is none of your business what they're doing. It's before me that they're going to stand or fall. They're going to stand before me on Judgment Day, and you don't need to be concerned at all. You know how much more peace you'd have if you'd just get out of everybody else's business? <laughs> Woo! Well, I don't know about you, but I was a real nosy person. <laughs> and I have to still resist that a little bit. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that I know how to do most stuff. And so. You know, I'm not only a teacher when I need to be a teacher, but I have to be careful about not teaching when I don't need to be teaching and not teaching people that are not wanting me to teach them. Like, you know, God had to tell me, you know what, you're not your husband's teacher. Well, that was a blow to my ego because I really love to tell him what to do. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> don't be thanking God publicly either, Dave Meyer. Do we have any other people here that are teachers of any kind, your school teachers or Bible teachers or something like that? Now, let me ask you a question. Don't you sometimes have a little bit of a hard time knowing when you should be teaching and when you should just be? Come on. Three people have a hard time. I, I'm going to get to the lying part in a minute. You might as well get straightened out before I get there. Now, I'm serious. If you are any kind of a teacher, then you do need to pray about this because you need to know when to function in your gift and when it's not a gift to anybody, it's actually a curse. <laughs> I'm in authority a lot of places where I go. I'm in authority in these meetings. I go in my office and I have a lot of authority, but I need to realize when I come down off this platform, I'm Dave Meyer's wife. Amen? 
I need to realize when I go to somebody else's church and I'm going to minister there, they're in authority. And I thank God that I've learned those things, but I didn't learn them easy. So even if you're a boss and you're in authority somewhere, you're not in authority everywhere. If you're a teacher and you teach at certain places and certain events, that's cool, but you're not a teacher everywhere you go. And we need to learn when to function in our gift and when to zip our lip and not be trying to tell everybody something. Everybody say, good preaching, Joyce. Good preaching, Joyce. All right. Verse 7. None of us lives to himself but to the Lord, and none of us dies to himself but to the Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Verse 10. Why do you criticize and pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you look down on or despise your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God and acknowledge Him and honor Him. I love verse 12, and so each of us shall give an account of himself, give an answer in reference to judgment to God. Then let us no more criticize and blame and pass judgment on one another, but rather decide and endeavor never to put a stumbling block or an obstacle or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Now, my third point is kind of part of what I've been saying, so it's going to be real easy to transition right into that because we're kind of already talking about it. And that is, the third thing you don't want to do with your mouth is give your opinion when nobody wants it. <laughs> Which is most of the time that we give it. And to be honest, I mean, I'm serious. I think we really need to learn to not be giving our opinion when people don't want it. And so often people say, well, I just wanted to help you. Well, what if I don't want to be helped? I know a woman that I dealt with for a long time, and I'm telling you what, that woman drove her kids crazy. She wanted to have a good relationship with them, and she was just ruining her relationship with them right and left, and she just didn't see it. She could not stop trying to tell them what to do. And they didn't want that from her. They didn't want her opinion all the time. And she would say over and over, well, I'm just trying to help them. I'm just trying to help them. But we need to realize that people want liberty. They want freedom to make their own decisions. Now, I'm not saying you go to the other extreme where if you know somebody's doing something that's going to hurt them that you won't bother to tell them because you think, well, it's none of my business. But I think we do have to ask ourselves, am I really trying to help you? Or am I just trying to tell you what I think that I know? So often, if somebody's not doing something the way we would do it, we feel like we have to try to straighten them out. Amen? And a lot of times, even when people do ask for your opinion, they don't really want it. I know sometimes I ask for people's opinion, and I'm trying to really learn this because, you know, a lot of times when you ask for somebody's opinion, all you really want them to do is agree with you. And if they don't agree with you, then right away you're like, well, I don't see how you could think that. But how many of you think that we need to just come up a little bit higher and just keep in our opinions to ourselves unless somebody really wants them? And I might as well just go for the gold here and tell you, I believe personally that's a symptom of pride. I think the more that we have to try to tell everybody else what to do, that means that we're already convinced we're right and that they need our advice. And I just think we need to give people more freedom. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. Just want to make sure you know I can back up what I'm teaching with Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. Now, I kind of tell you what I want to show you here so you're getting the main point out of it. You know, the Bible tells us that at all costs we're to avoid strife, which is bickering, arguing, disunity, disharmony, disagreement. And very often, strife is started, well, it's always started with the mouth. Somebody says something they shouldn't say, or they tell something they shouldn't tell, or they do something they shouldn't do. And I think this thing about opinions very often does start trouble. Have you ever had an argument with somebody just because they gave you their opinion about something you were doing and you didn't want it? All right. I mean, it happens all the time, to be honest. And so, 
I believe that's why it's covered in Scripture. And 1 Thessalonians 4 9 says, But concerning brotherly love for all other Christians, you have no need to have anyone write to you, because you yourselves have been personally taught by God that you should love one another. And indeed, you already are extending and displaying your love to all the brethren throughout Macedonia. But we beseech and earnestly exhort you, brethren, that you excel in this matter more and more. Now, this is my heart and my spirit right here. And I believe this is good for us. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I think that God appreciates a person who has a spirit that's not satisfied with status quo or is not satisfied with good enough. And so Paul wrote to them and he said, look, I'm not even writing to you because I think you don't have a love walk. He said, I believe that you are walking in love. But he said, I'm writing to you because I want you to press on and I want you to excel in love. And this is not the first place where Paul said this. He said it to the Philippians. He said it in many other places. Hey, you're doing good in your faith, but I want you to excel in faith. You're doing good in love, but I want you to excel in love. And so maybe you're saying, well, you know, I'm not too bad at giving my opinion. Well, you know what? Not being too bad is not good enough. You need to come up higher. And maybe you need to just stop before you give your opinion and just say a quick little prayer. Lord, is this something you want me to do? Is this you or is it just me? And I think it'll be amazing if we just submit things to God for just a second. How much vain conversation we can avoid and how much strife we can avoid in relationships. Now, I know that giving our opinion and telling people what we think is all part of relationship and it's all part of communication. And I'm not saying that we don't talk and we don't ever tell anybody what we think of anything. But I just think we have to be particularly careful. It's one thing if we're having a conversation, I tell you what I think of the tree or I tell you what I think of, you know, the government or I tell you what I think of the post office or something. But if I start telling you what I think about what you're doing, or what you're wearing, now I'm treading on more dangerous ground and I'm a lot more likely to cause a problem than if I'm just talking about some abstract thing that nobody cares all that much about. And I'll tell you, I need this preaching, so if you don't want to hear it, I'll take it. Because I'm telling you that I have been an opinionated person in my life. And I do believe that I've improved a lot, but I want to excel in this area. I want to mind my own business and have more peace than I've ever had in my whole life. I'll tell you one of the things that I believe happens, if you're in relationship with somebody and you're giving your opinion all the time, they get to the point where they don't pay one bit of attention to anything you say. And I mean, there's certain people that, that I'm around so, at some times that are like that. I've had friends that have been like that. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You can tell me again what you think. I don't care what you think. You know, so I think if we're a little less generous with our opinion, when we really have something to say, then the person might respect us enough to listen to it because we're not just yak, 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 and all the time. Verse 11, make it your ambition and definitely endeavor. This means you've got to try really hard to do this. To live quietly and peacefully, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands. So it's in the Bible, mind your own business. Well, you know, the words that we speak have tremendous power to impact our lives as well as those around us. Proverbs 12, 18 says that speaking rashly is like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Tanzania, and we're in the middle of Tanzania in a land where the Datoga people live. And my first visit here was over a year ago, and the conditions of what we saw here just absolutely broke Shelly and Mai's heart. There was no water. People would have to walk for hours and hours one way to get dirty water. There was no education. And so we started planning and, and asking, how can we make a difference in this? And so today, 
We're here and we have just dedicated one of five wells that we've dug in this area. And these are not just wells, they're solar paneled with pumps and they have reservoirs of 10,000 liters and they will just change this whole community. And we've dedicated a primary school that will, will do grades one, two, three, four, five. So we've literally changed this entire community uh, here in Tanzania and we just couldn't do it without you. So we're so grateful, the people are so appreciative and we say thank you and God bless you. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl partner. It's very painful and difficult to go through life with a wounded soul. I know because for years I lived that way due to being sexually abused by my father when I was a young child. But I learned that God could heal even my deepest hurts if I would just open my heart up and let him in. And in my new book called Healing the Soul of a Woman, you too can discover how to allow God into those wounded places in your life. God has a brand new beginning for you and you do not have to spend the rest of your life hurting. Bestel nu innerlijke genezing van de vrouw via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Bestel ook het werkboek bij het boek. Joyce koppelt gerelateerde bijbelteksten en de diepgaande vragen aan de specifieke hoofdstukken die je kunnen helpen de innerlijke genezing te ontvangen waarna je verlangt. Al gezien? Frisse impulsen. Joyce Meyer Nederlands op Facebook.